Thank you. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, drawing on both philosophical and sociological arguments, I will present a very short and rough sketch of the thesis that the reasons mobilized in support of territorial citizenship-based exclusions are weak. As a form of categorical inequality, national citizenship is normatively untenable and sociologically dysfunctional. This, however, is not a thesis about the possible result of our debates on migrants, refugees, and citizenship rights. It's just about finding the adequate starting point for these debates. So I'm starting with my philosophical arguments. The, the implicit but pivotal notion of modern normative discourse starting in the 17th century is that, in the word of Ronald Dworkin, that every person has an individual right to equality of concern and respect, and the first deri derivation of this most fundamental principle of Western, I think, moral and legal thinking is that there is a right not to be legally discriminated against. So the premise of egalitarian individualism is that all human beings are born free and equal, thus shifting the burden of proof, the burden of justification to those insisting on e inequality, to those who claim that different groups of people constitute qualitatively different types of human beings which cannot be judged by or treated according to the same standards. So, given an individual right to equality of concern and respect, legal discrimination demands justification. Thus emerges a generalized expectation of inclusion and equal respect for all, violation of which is deemed discriminatory and hence requires a strong and case-specific justification rather than being taken for granted. Under conditions of normative modernity, just such uh, justifications, however, are increasingly hard to come by. Hence, the delegitimization of categorical inequalities and the call for remedial action wherever and whenever they occur. This idea started at historic dynamics, which have led to a coherent, I think, a consequent and a directed process, and yes, there are directed processes in history, we cannot but analyze the unfolding of a principle. And as far as it actually can unfold, the right to equal concern and respect turns against all forms of defiance of it. Its logic is egalitarian and inclusive, aiming at the inclusion of, inclusion of all persons into its realm. Well, to be sure, the bundle of rights advocated by 18th and 19th um, century liberals was much more liber limited than what 200 years later came to comprise the <coughs> UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights on the following conventions. Yeah? The liberals of the time pleaded for the civil and political rights of a citoyen status for which only a very small fraction of the population qualified. A large majority of humankind was thus excluded. The poor, the property-less classes, women, children, in most cases also non-Caucasians, non-Europeans, non-Christians, as well as numerous others who were either deemed dependents and hence by definition ineligible or otherwise found to be lacking. So the history of human rights, which was originally limited the history of the idea of human rights, which was historically limited and originally limited to white, male, free, heterosexual, and economically independent citizens, is a history of ex ex extension. What we see, and what most of us promote, is the progress of a historical learning process, which is far from being completed. So egalitarian normative individualism is the normative reason for why modern society can tolerate a great deal of gradual inequality, but no form of categorical discrimination. And I do not wish to belittle the brutal consequences of disparities in wealth and power even in our countries. I think Agustin Jose Menendez made that point crystal clear yesterday. But categorical inequality is special. In principle, 
modern society's tolerance for gradual inequality of wealth, income, power, status, is compatible both with its structural mode of organization and its ideational foundations. But modern society cannot accommodate persistent categorical inequalities, for these have been rendered historically obsolete and they are fundamentally at odds with our society's self-understanding. And of course, most of these exclusions initially seemed completely self-evident to the contemporaries. But the inclusionary logic of the human rights discourse turned against them from the outset. Aren't women human beings too? Aren't there persons too? Well, yes, uh, but, and this is the point where the trouble started, what could one possibly say to defend the curbing of women's or some other category of people's rights? Since the liberal case for freedom and equality implied that those subject to legal norms are both the putative authors and addressees, the reasons brought forward by any would be defector had to be publicly presentable and universally acceptable had to be reasons that nobody could reasonably reject. And as it turned out, such reasons, don't, such reasons don't exist. Categorical inequality proved indefensible all over the plate. So over time, one bastion of legal discrimination after another fell. It might take decades, even centuries of struggles before a new social category was admitted to full membership of a political community, but eventually the walls of exclusion had to come down. So, despite their distinctness, most categorical inequalities share two commonalities. First, their thorough delegitimization, and second, their widespread legal abolishment, at least in the world of liberal democracy. Just think of the whole battery of anti-discrimination laws on the European Union level. There is However, one important exception, and that is the case of citizenship, whose exclusionary effects are both widely accepted and backed by law. Citizenship is a status notion. It is a form of categorical inequality, and it is a form of feudal-like birthright attribution. The vast majority of the global population has no way to acquire membership except by circumstances of birth. To the extent that citizenship is a valuable resource, it's currently secured on the basis of a morally arbitrary set of criteria. And this, of course, as you put out, Stroaska, this, of course, does not mean that citizenship is not a rule-based normative concept. Of course it is. All I'm saying is that the normative justification for it is lacking. Nevertheless, Citizenship-based exclusions continue to be far more widely accepted than any other kind of categorical inequality which were historically no less firmly held to be justified. The categorical distinction between citizens on the one hand and strangers or foreigners on the other is built not only into the basic structure of the modern state, but of the modern state system as well. The power to admit or exclude, okay, aliens, Sorry. No, it's not here. Okay. Oh, it's big. Okay. The power to admit or exclude aliens is inherent in sovereignty and essential for any political community, or so we are told. As such, the categorical distinction between citizens and strangers or foreigners is essential to the segmentary organization of the world political system, and segmentary means pre-modern, from which it cannot be easily detached or which affords its globally recognized legitimacy. So citizenship cages the entire world population in bounded territorial spaces both serving to justify ownership stakes and functioning as a regime of forced immobility. In this latter capacity, it contributes decisively to perpetuating vast social inequalities in life chances. Exclusion on the base of citizenship, a conventionally ascribed status, continues to be taken for granted as something 
natural, just as other ascribed categorizations that are now widely regarded as dubious, such as race or gender, were before the deconstruction. There is, however, nothing apolitical or neutral about any of these birthright regimes. Citizenship assigns unequal positions and unequal actual life chances in the world political system that tend to carry over to subsequent generations, forming the basis of an inherited privilege or disadvantage. Birthplace and parentage are natural contingencies, and as such, they are arbitrary from a moral point of view. People ending up with the wrong citizenship through the morally arbitrary accident of birth are bound to be a subordinate position in a global structure of unequal positions, which thwarts their opportunities from the start. And I think exactly this should be the starting point of our debate. So, is citizenship special then? Do we have good reasons? for treating it differently than other forms of categorical discrimination, like sexism or racism or homophobia? Are there maybe functional reasons to do so? I'd say apparently not. But the answer to this question is beyond my topic, as I'm talking only about the adequate starting point for the debate. So let's say only so much. Yes, national uh, citizenship does help to preserve some degree of bounded membership in the imagined community as a source of security, continuity, and identity. But open borders do not make democratic self-governance impossible. And there is no reason to claim that the self in self-determination and self-governance must be defined by the privileged people themselves and by protecting them from changes in the demos. I think I'm close to Catherine Collier at this point. Moreover, I do not think that there are really any constitutive ties in a strong communitarian sense in our pluralistic liberal societies today, which would be threatened by a weakening of the idea of national citizenship. Yeah? We can adjust our imagined communities and we can change our identity narratives and there will still be Jane novels. Nor, I think, is the functionality of legal systems threatened by opening borders. But my point here is a more moderate one. It's just that the burden of justification rests on those who claim that national citizenship is a necessary form of categorical discrimination, a point Luis Pereira continued already made yesterday en passant. There is, however, quite another set of arguments to show that national citizenship is not only normatively untenable, that I was talking about, but it's also sociologically dysfunctional. This dysfunctionality, of course, serving in the last analysis as a normative argument again. Mm -hmm. So, my sociological arguments. The thesis is quite simple. The emergence of a functionally different differentiated global or world society renders implausible and in the last analysis renders obsolete considerations that underpinned the nation state based model of citizenship, which for functional reasons as for normative reasons must be replaced or at least complemented by the concept of a global citizenship. The sociological answer says that we live in a functionally, functionally differentiated society whose economic, political, legal, educational, scientific, medical, and so on systems have no need for tying their operations to categorical differences among position holders and or clients, which would subvert their proper functioning and performance. From the viewpoint of the systems, differences of sex, race, ethnic, ethnicity and the like make and cannot make any difference as long as individual position holders and clients qualify under the term of the respective systems in question, as long as they are good at their job, as long as they, are, they participate in the market, very important for the European Union, as long as they play by the rules regulating the exercise of political rights and power, 
as long as they contribute to the creation of new knowledge, as long as they teach and learn adequately, and so on. It would make a difference when firms, or it does make a difference when firms are forced to hire insufficiently qualified workers for some reason, or prevented from hiring better skilled ones, because social conventions or laws dictate this. It would be a, a difference when certain defendants must be acquitted or sentenced because of who they are and not because of what they have done. It would make a difference when the value of scientific findings would depend on the social status of those who generate them. In short, the emergence of a functionally differentiated society renders obsolete, entrenched so social hierarchies, which form the backbone of the structure of pre-modern, stratified societies which historically preceded it. So while egalitarian normative individualism is the normative reason for why modern society cannot accommodate persistent categorical inequalities, functional differentiation is the sociological reason for the obsolescence of categorical discrimination. So in short, a functionally differentiated society has no use for categorical inequalities that sort people according to preconceived status differentials. In the end, the natures of role asymmetries generalized by reference to the outside as, for example, to gender or race or sexual orientation, and thus generating structural disadvantages which pervade very different functioning systems transversally is not only offensive to our modern normative understanding. As Niklas Luhmann rightly claims, categorical discrimination is structurally dysfunctional. It is sand in the engine. Throughout the, the 20th century, of course, the terms society and nation state were essentially used as synonyms. Synony synonyms. That made some sense along as the territorial boundaries of the state were more or less coextensive with the boundaries of society's systemic operations. As long as economies were first and foremost national economies, as long as politics, science, education, medicine, the arts, and just about every other system of society were largely national endeavors which, however, they had become only in the 19th century after sustained efforts by the state to nationalize them. Today, the situation is different. Society subsystems increasingly project global horizons from their operations, constituting a global society and establishing a supranational regulatory regime which directly or indirectly shapes the living conditions of almost every human being. And thus, the notion of unity of society, Christine Chavastka talked about and used for the title of her presentation yesterday, seems problematic, at least from a sociological point of view. It even seems inadequate, because it presupposes a concept of society that just doesn't exist any longer beside its metaphoric use. There is no such thing as a national society any longer. And the question is unity of society. Unity of what exactly? We force the serious challenge of methodological nationalism in social sciences, as John Eric Fossum told us yesterday. But given the reorganization of society on a global level, unequal life chances in different parts of the world are determined to a significant extent by the daily operations of a world encompassing society and it's often enough highly contested systems of governance. If these inequalities are found to be unfair, then justice requires that the rules which generate them be changed. But in keeping with the conventions, the mere conventions of methodological nationalism, mainstream philosophy continues to delimit the scope of justice by the boundaries of the nation state, with citizenship serving as the central lever for grounding demands of justice. But if, if there is reason to believe that society itself has gone global, then so must justice and citizenship. Global citizenship is the necessary conceptual counterpart to a societal reality which can no longer be contained within national borders, nor be, nor be adequately governed by national institutions or national actors alone. 
And if principle of justice ought to be applied to community of global rather than national citizens, then their reach too must be globalized. Global justice is the in inevitable, in inevitable corollary of a globalized society for which a societal exterior has simply ceased to exist. Thus, citizen rights must become global rights, and the normative case for restricting them to the national level just collapses. To sum up, the latest wave of globalization that began around the turn to the 1980s has effectively rendered obsolete the nation-state-based model of citizenship by giving rise to the emergence of a world society. The model of the nation state, however, posits a congruity between the state, between territory and citizenship. This model treats mobility within the nation state as normal. Mobility within, mobility between nation states, on the other hand, is understood as generally anomalous. Although mobility is an intrinsic dynamics of societal modernization, as Lule Sekeus has demonstrated so powerfully yesterday. It is precisely this nation-state model that lends credibility to a system of tightly controlled borders, which routinely excludes billions of non-citizens from the territories of rich countries. But if the forces of globalization have undermined this model's normative foundations, as I claim, then such exclusion is no longer justifiable. Instead, the borders have to be thrown down, opened up to all world citizens who request entry because in a truly global society, the distinction between internal and external mobility it dissolves, it just evaporates into thin air. So, assuming it turns out, upon thorough investigation and deliberation, that I'm right, that the reasons mobilized in support of territorial citizenship um, based exclusions are indeed as weak and untenable as the ones which were historically utilized in defense of other kinds of categorical inequality. Can we still uphold this praxis? And I think we can, but only at a considerable cost. To explain why, let me end my talk with a thought experiment. And this hypothetical scenario, once we have liberated ourselves from demands of consistency in one case, we will figure out we might as well do the same in other cases. So if we can freely discriminate against foreigners and non-citizens, huh, then why not also discriminate again against women, blacks, and homosexuals? Or to put it differently, if we can, uh, can get away with acts of xenophobia, then what should possibly stop us from being sexist, racist, and homophobic again, if and where this suits our interests? By today's standards, this is admittedly an extreme scenario. It does, however, shed light on a dilemma we face if we take the premises of our normative commitments of egalitarian individualism and the human rights logic seriously. Sexism, racism, homophobia, xenophobia are all practices no present-day liberal would openly embrace. The conventional understanding of xenophobia refers to the ill treatment of non-citizens after they have legally or illegally crossed the borders of a given country. To avoid that, we simply have to grant them negative rights and non-interference, which protect their physical and psychic integrity while under our jurisdiction. Most liberals would unambiguously support this. But in a world society, the notion of xenophobia assumes a new meaning. On this much more expansive understanding, xenophobic behavior begins with the very erection of borders. And the first act of xenophobia is to forcibly prevent anyone from crossing them. The only way to avoid that would be to grant all of humankind virtually unlimited mobility. If this is the price for consistency, however, then some of us may well get second thoughts about it. And that's probably the reason why, for the time being, territorial exclusions are far more widely accepted, if not actively endorsed and lobbied for, than other types of categorical inclusion. The logic of egalitarian individualism, however, is subversive. Critics of liberalism were sometimes more aware of this subversive logic than the liberals themselves. Let's take the liberal saint, uh, Mill, John Stuart Mill, for an example. In a review of John Stuart Mill's works published in 1866, a conservative critic claimed that the famous thinker, I quote, if he starts where he starts, in the end, he cannot help claiming the suffrage for the woman and even for the Negro, unquote. Such, no, 
Such conclusions are the inevitable results of the premises where he started, unquote. And they are indeed. There is an inner logic of non-discrimination. And if you try to be consistent, you can stop this process. Bill himself, as has been frequently noted, was far from consistent in the conclusion he personally drew from this premises. So he could at once be sympathetic to the cause of women's emancipation and be a strong defender of a brutal form of British colonialism. Similar inconsistencies pervade the work of illiberals to the present day. They, and I say by extension most of us, are still reluctant to draw the full conclusions of the premises to which they or we ostensibly subscribe. We preach the inviolability of human rights, but when the consequences appear to be too radical, too demanding, too uncomfortable, then we quickly back down, maintaining the case in question is different, so the human logic, human rights logic does not really apply. It does, however, apply also to the question of citizenship and territorial citizenship-based exclusions. As Joseph Karens wrote, citizenship in Western liberal democracies is the modern equivalent of feudal privilege, an inherited status that greatly enhances one's life chances. Like feudal birthright privileges, restrictive citizenship is hard to ju justify when one thinks about it closely. So the question if, is, do we really have better reasons than the noble classes of the Ancien Regime to defend our non-deserved privileges? Well, I don't think so. And in the end, and for the reasons I sketched, I don't, eat, I don't think either that the adequate response to the archaic mechanisms of conferring citizenship by virtue of birthright is the Rawlsian answer provided by Ayer Lekshacha, namely to impose a tax on the either to untaxed inherited property of citizenship in the name of global distributive justice. Financial redistribution in the name in favor of those who are less fortunate in their citizenship assignment, namely distributing revenues from citizenship taxes in the Western countries to specific projects designed to improve the life opportunities of children in the world's poorest nations, this form of redistribution is just not enough. My claim is that the structural incompatibility of global social and economic systems on the one hand and territorial citizenship-based exclusions on the other hand call for open borders. Thank you very much. <laughs>